So ladies and gentlemen, we've looked at speaking truth to power at the very highest levels of the civilian military nexus. Next, we want to switch our attention to some applicability at the more junior officer, field grade officer level. And it's my great privilege now to introduce our third speaker to talk on that topic. Dr. Leonard Wong is a research professor in the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College. He focuses on human and organizational dimensions of the military. He is a retired Army officer whose career includes teaching leadership at the United States Military Academy and serving as an analyst for the Chief of Staff Army. His research has led him to locations such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, Bosnia, and Vietnam. He has testified before Congress and his work has highlighted many issues and been highlighted in many national media outlets. Dr. Wong is a professional engineer and holds a bachelor's from the United States Military Academy, a master's and PhD from Texas Tech University. Dr. Wong's presentation will address the dynamics of speaking truth to power at the junior officer level. While this topic specifically addresses the Army profession, what he's going to talk about broadly applies to all professions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wong. So I am Lenny Wong. I'm a research professor at the Army War College. And what that means is that uh, they look across the faculty and they pick the ones that are socially awkward and they put us in a little building, no kidding, a little building and tell us to sit at our desks and do studies across the Army and my area is the human dimension. And, uh, and so I'm going to talk to you about a study that came out called Lying to Ourselves. Uh, but before I do that, anyone who's facing this direction, you might want to turn around and face that direction because I am extremely PowerPoint dependent. And plus the advantage of that is if I can't see your face, you could close your eyes every once in a while. Okay, and. Uh, so the study I'm talking about is called Lying to Ourselves, but it, and that came out uh, actually recently, but this study, Lying to Ourselves, the idea for it really started over a dozen years ago. Well, over a dozen years ago, the Chief of Staff of the Army came to the Army War College and said, I think we have a problem with our junior officers. I think our junior officers are, they're not independent enough. They're not being creative enough. They're not being, uh, they don't make decisions on their own, and I think it's because we crush everything out of them. We put so many requirements on them that they don't have an opportunity to make a decision themselves. He thinks, and so he came to the Army War College and he said, I need someone to go out there and find out every single mandatory training requirement that we put on company commanders, our junior leaders. And he says, I want you to look at them and I, I, I'm looking for non-mission essential tasks that we could cut in half and throw them out and return them back to the company commander's training schedules so they can actually have time to make decisions. So I got that task, they gave me 10 war college students, and uh, they got out of their strategic research paper, their giant thesis, and I sent them around the world to collect up every single requirement known to, a, known to mankind that we put on company commanders. And so we had to go back and brief the chief of staff of the army, and uh, we briefed him, and we said, chief, here's the deal. Company commanders somehow have to fit 297 days of mandatory training into 256 available training days. And when we take the non-mission essential stuff and cut it in half, it's 18 days we give back to them. It does nothing. See, Chief, the problem we have in our Army is we've got a culture where every level of leadership loves to create requirements for those below. And then we tell them what's important, what to do, how to do it. And then when they go to try to do it, we disrupt them later with last minute taskings anyway. So that's the culture, Chief. We just can't blame it on non, the non-mission essential stuff. We can't blame it on sexual harassment training or equal opportunity training. It's the culture that we have. So that was done a long time ago. I put it out in a study called Stifling Innovation. I briefed it around the Army. I put it on the shelf. And like I said, it was over a dozen years ago. But something out of that study always stuck in the back of my head. And that was, wait a minute, if it's physically, if it's literally, if it's humanly impossible, to do all the training that we're told to do, then what are we reporting? 
Well, I know what we're not allowed to report. What aren't we allowed to report? We can't report that we didn't do it, okay? So I sort of knew the answer to that. And I, so I went to a colleague of mine named Steve Garris, and I, sat, I do a lot of work with him, and I went up to his office and I said, Steve, I want to do a study. And he says, what's the study this study going to be on? I said, I, I think we're lying. I think we lie to ourselves. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. And so he's working away at his computer and uh, looking at me and looking at his computer. And I said, I think we are lying about stuff. And he says, look, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's an old retired geezer like me. And he says, uh, I've never lied. People know I don't lie. My wife knows I never lie. It's one thing I take great pride in, I don't lie. And so I said, uh, well, what are you working on? And he says, I'm entering in all my mandatory training. And I said, did you do it? He goes, no, I'm just entering it in. <laughs> and uh, I said, I think we have something to talk about here. So, um, so what I did is I said, okay, this is what I wanna do. I wanna make sure it's just not me cooking this up. I wanna go around the Army and find, uh, find out what's going in the Army. So I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, where I asked to meet in groups of six to eight captains in infantry and armor branch. I went to Fort Lee, Virginia, where I got the logistics captains, six to eight captains in a little groups, and I'd meet with them. I got to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where I'd meet in little groups of majors of all branches. At the Army War College, I'd talk to former battalion commanders of all branches, former brigade commanders of all branches at the Army War College. And I went to the Department of the Army at the Pentagon, where I uh, met with groups of action officers and civilians and talked to them. And I wanted people to come to these little groups, uh, but I didn't want to scare them off. So I didn't say, would you come talk to me about lying? I said, anyone who wants to talk to me about mandatory training requirements, uh, come with me and we'll have a little discussion. And the reason I did that is because if you want to get a good discussion going, get some army people together and say, so what do you think about mandatory training requirements? Because army people love to complain about mandatory training. And we just like start swapping, saying, you think that's bad, we got this. Well, you think that's bad, we got this, and we got this. And, and so it's, it's a, we have a great time in these little groups just complaining about all the mandatory training. And so that'd go on for, and we were, we're slapping each other on the back and having a great time. And, and I, suddenly I'd say to them, I'd say, uh, so uh, isn't it ridiculous that you can't do all this training in the amount of time that's given? And they say, yeah, it's ridiculous. And I say, so what do you guys report? And as soon as I said that, what do you think happened? Crickets. Crickets. Dead silence. Because what was I asking them? I was asking them, do you what? Do you lie? And it's one thing you don't do to someone in uniform is ask them if they lie. You don't ask someone in uniform if they lie, because that's an insult. You're offending them. And why don't we do that? Well, two reasons we don't do that. First of all, we are put up on a pedestal. I say we. I'm a retired guy. I'm really not in the profession anymore, but it really sounds bad when I say you guys. So I say we, even though it's really not me anymore. Okay, so, so we are put up on a pedestal, okay, uh, where society's busy telling us you are the most trustworthy people that we have ever known. When they look at all the institutions across the United States, the military is always on top. When they look at the leaders of all, any institution in the United States, the military leaders are always on top. So the Harris Poll finds that 55% of Americans say of all the leaders of any institution in the United States, we trust the military leaders the most, 55%. Now, I used to think 55% wasn't that high, but it's the highest. And you, when it's compared to 6 and 7% of Congress and Wall Street, it's pretty high, okay? <laughs> So society is busy telling us, you guys can be, are trustworthy, you guys can be trusted, you are a people of integrity, and we tell ourselves, we are busy telling ourselves that we are above the common way of a level of life. We are above society. We have integrity, we have honesty, because within the Army, when they did a survey of 20,000 Army people, 93% said that their values, their personal values, matched the Army values of honor, integrity, of respect and all that stuff. And so you got society telling us, you guys would never lie. You got us telling ourselves we would never lie. And some guy from the Army War College comes down and says, so do you guys lie? And that's why it goes dead silence. That's why I got comments like, nobody was ever asked to report something as true that was not. Or I've never given a false report. Never intentionally have I said, yes, we're 100% on this when I knew we weren't. And so there was, the room got really cold in every single meeting when I asked that question. But then I'd ask again, I'd ask it a different way, and after a while I'd get some comments like, well, you find ways to qualify your answer. It's not quibbling, it's assuming risk, or you gotta make priorities, or just, you got creative, and you heard words like massaging, hand waving, pencil whipping, and uh, finally someone after about 20 minutes would put their head in their hands and say, okay, fine, we lie. And right then, we could have a different discussion. 
but it took a lot of work to get up to that point. And right then, we could have a different discussion. And so I started saying, so now that we say this happens, how does this happen? And we'd start launching into mandatory training, which is good because that's easy to talk about, but it's bad because what I'm describing isn't just restricted to mandatory training. And when I say mandatory training, I think the Air Force calls it CBT, computer-based training. You know, it's easy to focus on that, but it's not just that. Um, it goes beyond it, but it's a good place to start. And so I would say, so, uh, like, what do you guys mean that uh, this stuff happened with mandatory training? And they would say, uh, well, you know, an example is like right before a deployment, we needed to uh, get everything ramped up. But we'd, so we'd do all the training, then we'd put everyone else on block leave, right, about a month before we had to go. Everyone would be on block leave, they'd all return, and we had about 30 days to get every single piece of training done that we had to do before we deploy. And uh, we had to get all the certificates of all the training, we had to get all the checklists done, and, uh, and the way we did that was, well, like for some of the training, we would pick the smartest dude, and he would go take it nine times for the other members of his squad, and that way they had a certificate to prove that they had completed it. Now, when you see that, what do you think? What do you think? Does it shock you? Does it shock you? Some, does, it, does this offend people saying this, this doesn't happen? Okay. Some people it says, holy smokes, what are you talking about? Okay. Other people look at it and say, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. And so that's what we're talking about. That's an example of mandatory training. That, uh, that happens. Okay, another example is what well, we had to give sexual assault training. So I gathered the boys around the radio and told them to listen in, and I said, don't touch girls, and that was the end of the sexual assault training. Okay, that's another example. That this is the stuff that goes on. Report it as completed. They reported it as completed. Another uh, first sergeant said the way we did mandatory annual training is we put the rosters on the table, okay, of all the annual mandatory training we had to do. We got different colored pens. I told all the NCOs to come in and fill out the rosters. That's the way we did the training, okay? That's what goes on in the Army. But that's not where it ends. It's not just mandatory training. But I'm interested in your emotional response when you see this happening, okay? When you see this happening, okay, what, do you, what goes through your mind? How could it be? Or, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's what's important that you have to think. Am I shocked? Or I say, yeah, I know that's happening. But it's not just mandatory training. It happens in other places. It happens in other locations. For example, it even happens downrange. So, and I asked for examples that happen downrange. An example that I got quite often was, well, you know, an example of what you're talking about is storyboards. A storyboard is a piece of intelligence, okay? It's a PowerPoint slide that you put pictures, maps, narratives, describing what happened during an event. And so what junior officers were telling me was, you know what? Um, if, we, uh, if a dog came onto the combat outpost and we shot it, we had to do a storyboard. If we went to a village and nothing happened, we had to do a storyboard. And if this happened, we had to do a storyboard. So we were constantly asked to turn in storyboards. And you know what? When you have four hours before the next patrol, you can spend time putting together a storyboard or you spend time getting ready for patrol. So often we would either copy and paste or totally make up storyboards. And so is it just mandatory training? No. It's Things like this, storyboards, okay? Uh, or it's also in the trivial things of life, okay? In the Army, if a person wants to go on leave, they turn in a, a Department of the Army Form 31, leave form. But you also have to turn in a vehicle inspection. You have to turn this in. This is called TRIPS. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? Okay, it's called travel risk planning system or something like that. So you want to go on leave and you say, you know, what, I'm going to drive him here to Indianapolis. I think I'll drive 10 hours. I'll do it by driving about eight miles over the speed limit, roll the window down, um, blare the radio, and sing loud. Okay, and have a can of monster there or something like that. And trips, you type that onto trips, trips will say what? Rejected. Okay, not safe. You can't do it. And so then what do you do? 
you change everything. You're saying, I will drive for two hours, I will stop, I will not take any prescription medicine, um, I'll have my mother-in-law in the back seat, you know, everything that you, anything to police trips, because when you go to turn in that leave form, it has to say you're okay. Tens of thousands of trips requests are turned in a year, every year. Tens of thousands that are complete lies. Complete lies, okay? Um, so, is it just mandatory training? No, we see it in serious things like storyboards. We see it in trivial things like trips. We also see it in administrative things like, that's the officer evaluation report. Now, I'm not gonna talk about what we write in OERs because you could go on forever talking about the fiction in those things. Now, I wanna talk about is the process of writing uh, officer evaluation report or an NCO evaluation report. And in that, um, well, you're supposed to sit down with the person and say, okay, let's talk about your objectives, your goals, and then we'll talk about what you expect to get done in the next year. So they write all that down, and that's your initial counseling. You put your little initials there. And then something's supposed to happen with that NCOER or OER support form. And that is you have three, actually there's four total quarterly counselings. So there's your initial and three follow-on. It's a real pain in the neck to do those three follow-on every three months because the person's deployed, you're busy, uh, it, just, it just never works out. So maybe you get two out of the other three done. You go to turn in the OER support form or the NCOER support form to the sergeant major or the clerk. You throw it down on the desk. The sergeant major or the clerk says, where's the quarterly counseling? To which you respond, I didn't get to do it. I forgot one. I mean, I didn't forget it, but we just never got together and went over it. I mean, I talk to the person all the time, but I never do the formal counseling. Sergeant Major, the clerk will say, where are the dates? That's what they'll say. Where are the dates? At that point, you will go in the other room and what? You'll come up with dates. You'll, except what will you think about those dates? You'll say weekdays. You get out of the calendar and say, I need to find a good weekday. Yeah, now, go, I brief this to the reserve component, and what do they say? Okay. I'm going to find a good weekend. Okay, and they, go, they search for a good weekend. And right beside that lie, what goes there? Your initials. How much time do we spend on the initials? Nothing. We don't spend any time thinking about the initials. We spend all our time agonizing about a good lie. And then we put our initials right beside it. That's what we live in. That's what we live in. That's the culture that surrounds us. No one tells us to do that. It just happens, okay? It just happens. Uh, but the question is, is how could that happen? How could it be that I walk into a room of people and I ask them, wait a minute, is, you're telling me that you're just surrounded, you're bombarded by all these requirements. How do, you, how do you deal with it all? And then I say, so do you guys lie about it? And everyone gets all offended at me. But then I can come up with, I can come up with 10 times as many examples of when we lie. How could it be that we lie and yet we don't want to admit it? Well, there's something happens called ethical fading. Something happens in ethical fading, and it's called ethical fading. That is, is that, you know what, you can sit in an ethics class and we'll say, you know what, if the Coke machine starts spitting out Cokes as fast as it can, is it ethical to take them? I think we all know the answer to that. No, okay, just in case anyone was surprised, all right? <laughs> so, uh, but for some reason, when it comes to these other examples, we start to say, well, that's not an ethical dilemma. That's, there's something else in there. And what we do is we take the spotlight of what is right and wrong, and we fade it away. And we say, you know what? It's not an ethical decision. There's no morality in here. There's no right or wrong. There's no truth or untruth, truth or dishonesty. It's, it's, it's a business decision, or it's, uh, it's a way of doing things in the army, or it's just the way things are. And so we try to remove it so it's no longer do you lie, it's, it's something else. That's ethical fading. And that allows us, as we go on in our lives, to think, think back and say, I never lied. That wasn't a lie. When I was a cadet at West Point, you were allowed to take someone's property, and as long as you said to yourself, I'm going to return this, it wasn't stealing. What was it called? Cadet borrowing. It's still that way? All right. It's cadet borrowing. We convinced ourselves that's not stealing because I meant to return it. It's just cadet borrowing, okay? Ethical fading is take, don't call it a lie. Just remove it from that category. Well, how do you do that? Well, the first thing is, I already mentioned, don't call it a lie. Don't call it a lie. Call it something else. So in the Army, what we do is we call it prioritizing. Or we call it taking risk. 
where one person said, it's not lying, that's good leadership. That's what they told me. It's not lying, that's good leadership. Don't call it a lie. That's the first step in ethical fading. The next step in ethical fading is, okay, you want me to forget that this is an ethical dilemma, that this is a truth or dishonesty decision? Numb me to death with me making this decision all the time. What do I mean? It's like constantly make me certify to put my signature down, put my initials down on something, and I'll, after a while I forget how important it is. So what's an example of that? Example of this is ethical numbing of this, is that uh, make me sign this statement every year that says, I have read and understand the above requirements concerning use of Army access systems. Has anyone ever seen that before? Anyone in the Army has seen it, okay? You just ignore it, okay? Just like I ignore it. That is our, if you want to use a computer system in the Army, we have to sign that every year. 1,800 words. It would be fine if it just said, I agree. Okay, but it doesn't say that. It says, I have read and understand the above requirements. I, I can almost guarantee you that nobody has ever read those words. Okay? They did a study in England. They wanted to look at free public Wi-Fi access and uh, the implications of that. And they said, uh, so they broadcast free public Wi-Fi on a street corner in England. And uh, they included, the, you know, when the splash page came open, they said, I have read and understand the following requirements. The first requirement was, I promise to give my firstborn child in exchange for free public Wi-Fi. <laughs> How many people do you think signed up for that? Every single person, because we're numb to those types of questions. Okay, I have read and understand. We're numb to this. And so every year, pff, just sign that. Just sign that. Get, get me on my computer. The last thing I need to do is do this. You want to ethically fade something? Don't use the word lie. You want to ethically fade something? Numb me to death. Numb me to death with it, and I'll, after a while, I'll just forget how important my signature is, how important my honor is, how important giving my word is, okay? So the next thing, if you want to ethically fade something, is, well, I know if I walk up to any of you right now and I ask you a question, you will tell me the truth. I just know that. You will tell me the truth if you face to face. But if I give you some distance, it provides us an out. And that's a good way to ethically fade something. What do I mean by that? Well, what we do in the Army is if uh, you want to clear a post, you're moving from one post to another post, and you find out you have to get through this giant scavenger hunt of checklist to go and clear a post, you walk into this one office and there's a little old lady in white tennis shoes who says, have you been briefed on the sponsorship program? I don't know if anyone's been briefed on the sponsorship program, but because we could sign it digitally, we have our little Com, uh, common access card, our CAC, okay, that allows us to sign that form digitally. And it's no longer me saying I got briefed on the sponsorship program. It's my little piece of plastic that allows me to say I got briefed on the sponsorship program. And that gives me some distance. And guess what? That allows me to live with it saying that wasn't a lie. I'm just clearing post. I just, that's just what you need to do. Or what we love to do in the Army is put a little distance between us and the lie, and that's through briefing charts. And so we briefed the chart there. It says uh, suicide prevention training, all. You mean to tell me every single person attended suicide training? No one was in the hospital. No one was temporary duty. No one was absent. Ma'am, the uh, slide's green. Uh, the slide is green. So suicide prevention training is green. That's what we do. We hide behind the colors. We hide behind the slides, OK? But we don't like to be up front. And so it gives us some distance, and so therefore, it's not a lie, it's something else. So the question is, is okay, fine. What, is, what if you know it's a lie? What if deep down inside you know you're not telling the truth? Well, we come up with two reasons to rationalize in the Army. The biggest reason that we might want to tell a lie if we know it's actually a lie is because, you know what, in the Army, there's a lot of dumb requirements. It's a lot of dumb requirements. There's a lot of request for information that, that is just a waste of my time. It's just, we almost say to ourselves, we're going to balance the scales of nature because there's so many dumb requirements, someone almost has to lie back to them to balance it out, okay? And so we convince ourselves that dumb things require a dumb answer, okay? So here's a junior officer that said, uh, this is the way he described life. He said, well, you can ask anyone in this room the purpose of declaring a troops in contact, these are radio reports, a casual evacuation. We know, definitely know why we do that stuff and why we're reporting. And people jump. They're timely, they're accurate. But then he points out, 
But some of this stuff is, you need this for why? Show me in the reports guide that we use that this is actually a required report. Because right now, it seems like you're just wasting a unit leader's time. So in this person's mind, they say to themselves, I know what's important, but I also know what's not important. And the unimportant things don't deserve the truth because they're wasting my time. I have other things to do than to come up with the truth for you. You're just wasting my time. I had some people tell me saying, you know what, I'll tell a commander the truth 100% of the time. Their staff, maybe 70%. Because I know the commanders I have to respond to, but the staff, they're just usually wasting my time. So the first step we do is we ethically fade. If we can't ethically fade, then we drop back and we start rationalizing. First way to rationalize is to say, that's a dumb requirement. It's not worth my time to do all the truth. But the second rationalization we have is, you know, I'm not telling this lie for myself. It's not to have a self-interest. It's for the mission or it's for the troops. And so that's the other rationalization. It's for the mission, it's for the troops. And I had a, uh, a Marine okay, give me this example of when he told a lie. And he said, that, well, the situation was that there was a, a platoon, and they had one platoon leader was replacing another platoon leader, so they're doing a relief in place, and IED goes off. Both lieutenants get injured. And he tells me, he says, I falsified the traumatic brain injury report that changed the distance from the IED strike to where one person was standing. So that way, someone didn't come back down and stick a finger in my CO's chest and say, you need to evac that lieutenant right now. If I do that, I'm going to put my boys in bags because they don't have any leadership. That ain't happening. I owe the parents of this country more than that. In this person's mind, he says, I know I told a lie. But in this case, I didn't do it for me. I did it for the platoon. But you have to ask the question, so what happened to the person that had the TBI that was never reported? Okay, and so they're off someplace. All right. But in this person's mind, they're justifying the lie uh, because it wasn't for themselves. It was for mission or for the troops. Are there any questions yet right now? Because see, by the time I get to the end of the presentation, I can't remember what I said. And so if you have a question, I'll just make up stuff. Um, so. Any questions or comments? Go ahead, just yell it. Uh, Jeff, say so from the Air Force Academy. So are you saying that all these instances are bad or good? Yeah, that's a good, yeah. What am I saying? Am I saying they're bad or good? What do you think? You want, that, this will be the last question when I do this. I go, so what do you think? Yeah, good answer. All right, go ahead. Some are good, some are bad. Yeah, why, now why would some be good though? Why would a lie be good? Okay, so maybe keeping the leadership there is better than being truthful? If, if that's okay, any other questions? I'll get to that in a second, and hopefully you don't feel bad. Okay, because really the question is, is so what? So what? He, maybe he saved a life. Maybe this is what you gotta do to survive in the army. Okay, maybe this has been going on forever. I mean, you hear the stories about Vietnam, you hear the stories about body counts and all that kind of stuff. Maybe this is just normal for the Army. Maybe it's normal for an officer to walk into the supply room, see the supply sergeant, see all this new stuff laying on the ground and say, holy mackerel, supply sergeant, where did all this stuff come from? And the supply sergeant's answer should be and will always be, you don't want to know. You don't want to know, okay? Maybe it's always been that way, maybe that's the way it should be which is fine, okay, but have things changed? First of all, have things changed since the old days? Well, the amount of requirements we put on junior leaders today, do you think it's gone up or gone down? It's gone up dramatically. The Army is like a compulsive hoarder because what the Army likes to do is collect requirements. Hey, I got something more for you. I got this new requirement. We just had a new requirement that's due by October 31st. Does anyone have to deal with that? in the Army, it's like you had to, dealing with classified documents, we had to watch a 35 minute YouTube clip, which I went through pretty quickly, okay, but, um, okay, but it's just another, here's another requirement, here's another requirement, okay, and uh, so had things gotten increased or decreased, things have gotten, they've gotten more, we've put on more. The other thing is technology. In the old days, the best we could do was search for a paper roster to find out if someone did the training. Today we have DTMS, Defense Training Management System, they just reach down to every individual to find out do they have a certificate for taking training. And so you combine the increased amount of requirements we put on people, not just training, but all administrative, logistical, 
readiness, everything. And then you put in the fact that technology can make a dashboard for a two-star to try to look across the entire command to see what's going on. Things are different. But despite that, the other question is, is, so why don't you leave it the way it is? The army still functions. The army is still a good army. Why are you making a big deal about this? And that's a good question. Is it a good or a bad thing? So what's wrong with leaving it the way it is? Well, if we leave things the way they are, what's the only casualty? What's the only casualty if we allow this to happen? Our integrity. That's the only casualty. So what's wrong with doing all this stuff? As long as you sacrifice your integrity, things will be fine. Do we want to do that? Or do we want to change the system, the culture, so that we don't have to sacrifice our integrity? That's the question. Because right now, if we leave things the way they are, I think there's five problems with the way things are right now. The first thing is if we leave things the way they are, every individual gets to determine what's right and wrong. So what do I mean by that? Well, when I put up that storyboard slide, okay, that storyboard, that, that intelligence picture, when I put that up in front of some people, they nod their heads and say, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I put that up in front of other people and they just go ballistic. People lied on storyboards? Are you kidding me? You do not lie on a storyboard. That's actionable intelligence. You, if someone was lying on that, that we're talking we're talking big trouble. But other people just nod their heads saying, yeah, that happened all the time. If we leave things the way they are, everyone gets to determine where to draw the line. And the funny thing is, is where does everyone think they're drawing the line? Exactly where it should be, even though you have all these lines drawn on the ground, all these different places, because every single person thinks that they know enough to draw the line. So you leave things the way they are, fine. Every individual gets to determine what's right and wrong. Leave things the way they are, the next problem is, is you can't trust anything. You can't trust anything. So when I go to Department of the Army and I say, get together these action officers and I say, hey, you know all this information that we busy, we're busy feeding up, all this sexual assault training, all this training, all this stats on this and this, it all comes up to here to you guys. What do you guys think of all this data, all this information that we feed in? And what do you think they said? I said, do you believe it? And they said, no, we don't believe it. Why don't you believe it? because we used to be there. We used to feed the system just like you guys did. We know you're giving it a good shot. We know you're trying your best, but we would never let a senior leader make a policy decision based on this data because we know that you're trying your best, but we know it's a lie. So we got this peculiar situation where we're busy feeding it lies. They know it's lies, and what do we all pretend? Everything's green. Everything's green, everything's fine. That's what we do, we have a facade going. I call it mutually agreed deception, where we all look at it and say everything's fine. If you leave things the way they are, we can't trust anything. So when the chief of staff of the army gets called over to Congress because sexual assault's blowing up, and Congress wants to know how many sexual assault response coordinators do you have, how many SARCs do you have, the chief t gives him this number, and he comes back to his staff, and the staff sits him down and says, chief, you know that number you gave him? It wasn't right. Because see, the units were busy saying, well, sexual assault response coordinator, does he mean one we have designated, one we have trained, one we're thinking about? Well, we gave him everything, okay? And it doesn't add up, Chief. The chief goes ballistic because he says, what can you trust? What can you trust? When we go to Iraq and we're gonna partner with Iraqi forces or Afghan forces and we say, you know what? You have to ask some of the officers sitting in your tables if this, how this works, okay? You show up there and the first thing you have to do is grade the Iraqi or Afghan unit on how proficient they are at their mission. And we always grade them amber or red, because they're not good. Okay, six months go by, we train them up, and all, we spend time with them, we rate them green. We leave, next unit shows up, they look at that exact unit, what do you think they rate them? Amber or red. Okay, they spend their six months with them, they leave, what do they rate them? Green, okay, and the next one comes in, amber, red, okay, and that goes on and on. And so what we do is we basically just, get, the rating starts meaning nothing. The rating starts meaning nothing. We discovered in our readiness reporting that uh, we'd go in front of Congress and say, we, we need more money. We, we need more money for readiness. And uh, because unless you give us more money, we can't train as, as hard and as realistically as we can. Congress looks at us and says, well, your readiness reporting all says that you're, what do you think it all says? You're perfect. You're perfect. Because you're busy feeding us numbers. 
You leave things the way they are, not only do every individual get to determine what's right and wrong, but you can't trust anything. Another problem with leaving things the way they are is that it hides careerism. So when you're sitting at a meeting and everyone's saying, uh, yeah, we're 100% on human trafficking training, okay, the one person that lies because they want to save their soldiers time because they didn't do all the human trafficking training because they had to do training on something else or they had more important things, you can't tell the difference between that person and a person that didn't do the human trafficking training because they're incompetent, because they don't care. It hides careerism, is that someone who wants to look good, you can just lie to look good. Okay, we come up with all the reasons, but some people, and if we admit it, everyone has the desire to look good, okay, but it hides careerism. Leave things the way they are, everyone gets to lie, and you get to lie about moving up the ladder. Okay. So the fourth reason is why you can't leave things the way they are is because if we leave things the way they are, what we do is we take our young leaders and we teach them how to be hypocrites. We teach them how to be hypocrites. We, have, we show them unconsciously, inadvertently, that to do well, to succeed in the army, you have to lie. I used to think this started when you came into the army, but someone stopped me and said, no, you know, it really happens before you come in the army. And I said, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, it happened for me when I uh, went to the, from the recruiter to the MEP station, and there I sat down with the counselor, and the counselor said, okay, we've got this paperwork to fill out, goes through the questions. One of the questions is, how often did you smoke dope? Or weed, as they say today. Did you smoke weed? And so the person writes down, yeah, I tried it twice. Hands the per paperwork in. What does the counselor say? You might want to rethink that. Okay, you might want to rethink that. At that point, this person said, I understood that this is what you have to do in the Army. You tell them what you want. For me, I learned it when I was a brand new second lieutenant. And, uh, there's a hundred of us in an auditorium. It's our first Army physical. There's a doctor's up front, and uh, we're filling out the Army paperwork for the physical. And they say, block one, write your first, last name. Block two, write your first name. Block three, write your Social Security number. We get down to block 12, and it says uh, your current physical condition. And they said, in block 12, write, I am in excellent physical condition. So all hundred of us write, I am in excellent physical condition. For 20 years of an Army career, I wrote in block 12, I am in excellent physical condition. Okay. I wasn't in excellent physical condition, but they had trained me that on that physical, right in there, I'm in excellent physical condition. Otherwise, you're going to get some kind of questions coming back at you. If you want to get through and not get kicked out of the Army, right, I'm in excellent physical condition. Except, which physical do you think I said, I'm not going to write that? My retirement physical, okay? I said, no, my legs hurt, I can't hear, you know, this kind of stuff. And, but I had been trained at a very early age. Hey, I know your signature's on the bottom of that, but it doesn't make a difference. You have to write in there, I am in excellent physical condition. And we teach our junior leaders to be hypocrites. We teach our junior leaders to talk about integrity, and yet we teach them falsify a roster. And so that's what we have in the Army as a culture. Uh, one of the things that, when I started doing this study, that got me going on this is I was talking to a civilian friend, and he says, you know, my wife's moving up in management. And I said, what, what happened? And he said, uh, well, her boss got fired. And uh, I said, for what? And she worked for FedEx. And he said, well, she, they had mandatory training at FedEx, and she, uh, her boss was caught uh, falsifying the training rosters. Now, anyone in the Army, what do you think I thought when I heard that? I, heard, I thought, so? <laughs> I mean, really? I thought, so. I didn't say it. Because I was thinking, you know what, we do that all the time in the Army. We do that all the time in the Army. And that's what we've gotten to, is we don't even think it's wrong. So what do we do? We teach hypocrisy, okay? So every individual gets to draw the line where they want. You can't trust anything. It hides careerism. It teaches our junior leaders to be hypocrites. But there's something else that if we leave things the way they are, it damages the profession. It damages the profession. What do I mean by that? Well, see, we're a profession. This is not an occupation. It's not, a, it's not just a job. It's a profession. Professions are known for doing something that no one else can do. That's the military. The military does something that no one else can do. But a profession is also trusted by society to do what it, no one else can do. A profession trains its own leaders, but there's also something else about a profession. And that is when a, something goes wrong in a profession, it polices itself. That's what defines a profession. When the doctors have a problem, the American Medical Association steps, set, steps in and says, we've got to do something about standards. When lawyers have a problem, the American Bar Association steps in and says, we've got to do something about this. 
When the army has a problem, well, if we don't do anything about what's going on, somebody else will step in and fix it. Somebody else will step in and fix it. And that's not what happens in professions. But maybe I'm overreacting. I mean, really, do you think I would ever get an email that says something like, hi, Lenny, I recently read an article about mandatory training requirements faced by the military. As a current legislative staffer, I figured I could actually help provide a solution to the problem. Are you ever in Washington? Could we schedule time to talk on the phone? Do you have a list of all the units' an annual mandatory training requirements? I'd love to see the entire list and possibly some, determine some courses of actions to eliminate some. Thanks a lot. Do you think I'd really get a letter from a legislative staffer of Congress to say, I'll help you guys with your lying problem? Yeah, I got that. Okay, I got that email. And as soon as I got that email, I said to myself, maybe I shouldn't have done that study. I mean, I really thought that. Maybe I shouldn't have done that study because the last thing we need is Congress telling us how to tell the truth. Okay, we just don't need that. A couple weeks after this, GAO called me up and said we'd like to do a study on you guys telling the truth on about all the requirements. And I said, you know what? We need to fix ourselves because that's what professions do. We don't wait around for someone else to fix them. So that's why we have to do something because what we don't want to say is, you know what? The Army still rolls along. All we have to do is sacrifice our integrity. All we have to do is go along with the lies. The irony of all this is, is, is the cure more ethics classes? No. Is the cure moral courage? Is the cure moral courage? Now, what I'm trying to say is, you know what? We could say the cure is moral courage, but it's not. Okay, because what I'm really trying to say is this. It's really four points. First is, we lie. We lie. The second point is, we don't like to admit it. We like to ethically fade it, so we say we don't lie. First point, we lie. Second point, we don't like to admit it. The third point is, this happens as you go up in the ranks. Sometimes we cause others to lie underneath us. We pass requirements down to them. We just pass it along and we say, look, I just want to sit in the briefing and I want you to tell me everything's green. That's what I want. So sometimes we pass on requirements or we say you can't go on leave until you tell me everything's fine on your trips report or whatever. We cause others to lie. The fourth point is the system, the system sometimes causes us to lie. When you put all those four things together, we lie, we don't like to admit it, sometimes we cause others to lie, the system causes us to lie, moral courage won't fight that back because we live, we are surrounded by this, this entire culture. So, what does this study recommend? Well, it recommends three things. Now you gotta remember, recommendations are really easy to write down in a study, but they're really hard to execute. But the first thing that we have to do to deal with this situation is we have to acknowledge the problem. We have to acknowledge the problem. We have to acknowledge those four things I just said. If we wanna take this on head, head on. There's one subpopulation in the Army, though, that finds this extremely difficult to acknowledge. What subpopulation do you think that is? Senior leaders. Senior leaders have a hard time listening to this. Now, why might they have a hard time listening to this? Why? Why might senior leaders have a hard time? What's that? It's suggested that they lied. Okay, and that's a hard thing to deal with. It's like, and you know, sometimes we like to ethically fade it and say, I, I never, I never lied. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, and so it's hard to say I was part of this system. And not only was I part of this system, I helped make this system. So not only did I drink the Kool-Aid, I made the Kool-Aid, and I was successful in this whole system, okay? Senior officers also have a hard time acknowledging it because they don't live in the same world as everyone else. So when they wanna go on leave, they don't have to do trips. When they wanna do something, they don't have to put up with all the administrative things and so a lot of times we talk about all the burden of all the crush of requirements they say I don't know what you're talking about I can't I, I don't know you're you're talking about something I don't deal with and so that kicks in and plus the fact that once you get older trust me you fade away a lot of things and this might be part of it, what we fade away is the 
the daily grind of things and how we dealt with it. So acknowledge the problem is the first step. The second step is someone needs to exercise restraint. That means at every level, we just can't pass those requirements through. We just can't say, well, you know, I know it's stupid you have to do this, but you have to still have to do it, okay? And I'm just going to pass it. Someone needs to say, no, you know, we need to stop it. We need to stop passing on all the mandatory stuff, all the administrative things we, we've created, every single rule known to mankind. We have to stop them sometime because what we're doing is we're creating a system that causes people to lie back to us. So acknowledge the problem, exercise restraint, and then the final recommendation the study makes is we need to lead truthfully. And what that means is, you know, there comes a point that someone has to say, do you want the truth? Do you want the truth? Because I'll try telling you the truth. Now, the reality is, is you can't tell the truth as an individual for very long. Because what will happen? You will be isolated out because everyone else is telling 100. You go to a meeting, there'll be five company commanders, six company commanders there talking to their battalion commander, and they'll be briefing their charts, and everyone will say 100% on human trafficking training, until, except one person who says, uh, I'm going to tell the truth, we're only at 78%. Well, guess what? You do that about twice, and you won't be a company commander anymore. Okay? So what has to happen is, is to lead truthfully, you need all those company commanders to get together before the meeting and say, look, let's stop telling the lies on this. Why don't we just tell the truth? Okay? So let's tell the truth on this. Let's tell the truth on this. The boss won't tolerate the truth on that, so we'll tell him what he wants to hear on that. Okay, we'll tell the truth on this, and, and then we'll go in and we'll start telling the truth on things. Because we don't have to do, have this little dog and pony show, this facade of a briefing where everything's perfect, just because that's the way the Army does things. But let's tell the truth on things. At the Army War College, we saw this happen when uh, telling the truth. See, at the Army War College, when academics want to go to a conference like this, okay, because the GSA went to Las Vegas and had a wonderfully good time at one of their conferences, the Army crunched down on attending conferences and said, you need special permission. And for us, our special permission was we had to go to the Joint Staff in the Pentagon and ask permission for an academic to go to a conference. And so we had two academics that wanted to go to a conference, and uh, the person that sends an email to the Joint Staff, the J7, is uh, our provost, our second in command below our two-star. And so he has to send an email to the J7 saying, I've got two academics who want to go to an academic conference. And in order for them to go to the academic conference, I have to tell you that it's mission critical. Those are the key words. It's mission critical that they go to the academic conference. Um, so he sends the email saying, two academics want to go. I know you want me to say it's mission critical, but it's not mission critical. You see, they don't. If they want to go because of professional development, but if they don't go, if you deny permission, the Army War College will continue to do its mission, and they won't, they won't hurt the mission of the Army War College. So it's not really mission critical. And we just had this study come out that says we have to stop lying and start telling the truth. So I'm telling the truth. It's not mission critical, but they really need to go. Can they go to the, Army, can they go to the uh, conference, uh, an academic conference? They send that email up to the J7. J7 sends what back? Is it mission critical? Provost sends back? Yes, it's mission critical, okay? So he had to buckle in. Okay, but what he did was he said, I'm gonna tell the truth. It's not mission critical. He made them say, no, tell me the lie. Tell me the lie. Several weeks after that exchange, the J7 said, you know how we make you say it's mission critical? You don't have to do that anymore. Stop telling us it's mission critical, okay? Several months after that, they said, you know how you guys now have to send us an email asking permission, but you don't have to say mission critical? Don't even send us an email anymore. You decide at your level. That's hap what happened was our provost decided to lead truthfully. And he showed them saying, I could tell you whatever you want me to say, but it's going to be a lie. If you want me to lie to you, let me know. For me to come to this conference, for me to go temporary duty anywhere, I have to tell a lie. Does anyone know what that lie is when I have to come here? When I fill out my defense travel system authorization, I have to put in there, this cannot be accomplished through video teleconference, okay? Could I do this through a VTC? Yeah, I could do this. I've done this over the phone to, to audiences, okay? I could do that, but I tried writing in there, VTC is not as effective. What do you think I get? 
rejected, okay, VTC not appropriate, audience interaction re rejected, okay. What do I put in there now? I put in their big paragraph on how VTC would, is impossible and all this kind of stuff. Um, someday, I will break their will and I'll be able to put in there, VTC is possible, but this is more effective. But right now, I can't do it. Okay, so they force me, the system forces me to tell a lie for me to come here and stand here because I have to say, you couldn't do this by VTC when you really could. That's how I'm saying moral courage. I wish moral courage would solve that, okay? But the system, it's the systems that's crushing us, and we can't be part of that system. So that's, this study came out in February 2015. I just posted it online. Now, um, I'm not stupid, so before the study went out, I sent it to the Office of Chief of Staff of the Army. I sent it to the Office of Chief of Public Affairs. I sent it to the Office of the Legislative Liaison at Department of the Army. The response I got back was crickets again, nothing. So I said, I'll post it online. So I posted it online. Um, the reaction I break into three phases. Okay, the reaction I break into three phases. And what happens, I posted it on a Tuesday. On Wednesday, it shows up in the Washington Post. Headline says, lying in the military is common. Army War College study says, shows up in CNN. U.S. Army officers lie routinely. Shows up in Time Magazine. Shows up in Army Times. Okay, and Army Times actually had a pretty good article on it. But what was interesting about the Army Times article was the picture that accompanied the article um, was a little different, okay? And so then I started seeing, uh, I started watching the reaction of the force, and that's what I want to talk about next, is uh, what was the reaction of the force? And I break it into three phases, and uh, well, I'm at the age now where my peers are senior leaders. They're senior decision makers. And so I started getting cards and letters in from my fr friends, and I could say something, okay, I could see the reaction um, of, of senior -like, uh, types. And so uh, here's, a, uh, here's an email I got from one uh, friend and he works at the Department of the Army, and he says, uh, you can see it's uh, subject is uh, researchers conclude that lying in the Army is common, and he sends this email to me saying, Lenny, really? <laughs> and then he writes, just how twisted is the media take on your research? Okay, that showed me something. Uh, it showed me what was he basing his impression on? The, the headlines, the headlines. So my response back to him was, read the study. Read the study, but that told me something about the senior military leaders, okay? Their reaction to this study when it came out was they saw the headlines and they thought to themselves, here's another guy trying to make a name for himself, talking about senior leader misconduct. You know, for a long time we had, see every senior leader was doing something illegal or something like that. They thought, oh, just put that in this pile. No, I wasn't talking about senior military leaders, okay? I was talking about the culture we have in the Army. And, uh, but they thought, because of the headlines, that it was just a, an attack on the profession. And as stewards of the profession, senior leaders started stiff-arming me, okay? I would go brief a room full of general officers, and you'd walk in, and they'd all be sitting there like this. And that doesn't feel good when you walk in like this. And then they'd say, well, I question your methodology. I didn't have any methodology on this, okay? I just talked to people. Or, well, there could have been a better time for this study to come out. Well, when's a better time for a study to come out saying we lie to ourselves? You know, and so that was the reception I got from the senior leaders. Uh, 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 anger, denial, the fact that I was just maybe hurting the profession. Now, on the other hand, I was looking for signals from the rest of the force saying, how are they reacting to this study? And I could look at one place, and that's on Facebook called Doctrine Man. Does anyone know about Doctrine Man? It's what the force uses, okay, to sort of bat ideas around. There they featured it in there, but what's interesting is comments like, in other news, water is wet. <laughs> okay, so what is he saying? Duh, you make a living doing these studies? I mean, it's an open secret. Why? Everyone knows this. S but think what I'm thinking, okay? On one hand, I'm getting, how could you? This is not true. What are you talking about? And on the other hand, I get, everybody knows this. That says something about our profession. When one part of it says one thing and the other part says we all knew this, what does that say about our profession? Okay, so what I discovered in phase one was I saw that anger and denial on one side and no kidding on the other. And when I say one side, I really look at post-brigade commanders is one side and everyone else is on the other side 
The force is busy saying we live this, whereas senior leaders say not so fast. What I discover is that once you finish brigade command, competition in the Army gets very steep as everyone's in the search for general officers. And it's extremely hard for that crowd to talk about this, to admit this goes on, because it might show that they're not as perfect as everyone else in their search for general officer. And so there's this natural resistance. That was phase one, anger and denial plus no kidding. Phase two started kicking in, and that was I started seeing the bureaucracy bend. I started seeing little indicators that the bureaucracy is trying to deal with this. And so uh, what did that look like? Well, I got an email from Department of the Army, uh, their G3, and they said, uh, hey, you know that study you did a dozen years ago that started this whole thing uh, where you said we had 297 days of training requirements? Could you send us how you calculated that? I think what it was is they thought I just made up the numbers. And so they wanted to see, like, did I have any rationale? And I happened to have the spreadsheets from all the War College students that collected everything. And so I put them on this gigantic file, and I sent it to them, and I never heard a word back. Okay? But then I also got uh, other indicators that the bureaucracy was trying to get a handle on things. They were focused on the mandatory training, but I could tell that they were trying to get a handle on things. I got an email from a major at San Antonio. Uh, Fort Sam Houston, who said, don't use my name when you show this email, but he says, I think you might find this interesting. And he sends this email that says, uh, here's a uh, short suspense, that means it's short due date, mandatory reporting, uh, no later than 5 March, identify, uh, identify mandatory training and non-training reporting policy requirements that leaders must submit to higher headquarters in order to show compliance. In other words, they're lo looking for every single requirement placed on company commanders. Okay, now what's, if you look at that carefully, you notice what's interesting about that tasking. They gave them a day to do it. A day to do what I took six months to do with 10 War College students. They wanted some clerk someplace to do in less than a day. I gave you an example of when we lie. One of the examples was what? You give me a what? You give me a dumb requirement and I'll do what? I'll give you right back something dumb. Okay, so this person says, I think someone, this major that sent me this email said, I think someone read your study, but they don't understand it. Okay, but I could see the bureaucracy was trying to move. In 2016, uh, headquarters, Department of the Army puts out an executive order saying a two-star can pull one of those mandatory training requirements off the list. Okay, and I thought to myself, I did a study, it resulted in policy changes. I sent that to my mother to uh, just show her that I'm actually you know, gainfully employed. But I was briefing this out at the pre-command course at uh, Fort Benning, and uh, some lieutenant colonel raised his hand and said, so what else you got? I said, what else you mean? I, I got uh, policy change because of the study I did. I mean, he says, so what else do you have, though, besides that? I said, what do you mean? He says, a two-star? A two-star can say we're not going to do this? What about me? What about my level? And that's where we go into the third phase, OK? Because I started sensing that there was some disillusionment going on because the culture hasn't changed dramatically since the study came out. There's a lot of talk about it. We see a lot of big pieces at the top. But see, I brief this to, uh, I brief this to senior officers, and someone always raises their hand and says, hey, uh, do you uh, brief this to cadets? And I say, yeah, I brief it to cadets. Why? And what do you think they say? Because that's where the solution to this will come. And then I brief it to cadets, and someone always raises their hand and says, what? <coughs> Do you brief this to senior officers? And I say, yeah, I brief this to senior officers. Why? And they always say, because that's where the solution is going to come from. <laughs> but you see, where is the solution going to come from? It comes from all of us. We can't sit around waiting for policies to change. But on the other hand, they can't wait for us to tell the truth because we're trapped in the system. And so that's where we are today. We have to learn to live with hypocrisy. We have to learn that the system hasn't changed. Okay? The system will change. I'm optimistic. But right now, the culture changes so slowly that we have to learn to live with hypocrisy. While the seniors say, we'll work on this, and we continue to live in this. That's where we are now. But I had to ask myself, I had to ask myself, so where did, how did we get into this? We did not set down this path saying, let's lie to ourselves and accept it and not call it lying. We didn't start down that. What, what happened to us as a profession that we got into this predicament that we're in? And I think what it was is, well, back in the old days, 
when a soldier wanted to go on leave, when PFC Smith wanted to go on leave, they turned in one form. And that was Department of the Army Form 31, Request for Leave. But if that soldier didn't come back, off a of leave on time, we didn't go to the filing cabinet and say, what was their travel plan? Did anyone inspect their vehicle? Did they have enough money for a return trip? We didn't look for all that paperwork. If we wanted to find all that information, what did we do? What did we do if we wanted to find out, this, did the person have a, a plan for leave or not? We would go to a supervisor. We would go to a leader. And sometime along the way, we said to ourselves, you know what? Those leaders are human. And leaders who are human aren't perfect. And leaders who are human who aren't perfect will let us down. And we don't want to be let down. Because it's hard to sleep at night knowing you're dealing with people who are, who are imperfect. And we convinced ourselves that what we want to live in is a perfect world where everything briefs green, where everything's a go, where everything is nice and tidy. And so we said, you know what? Instead of trusting people, we could get perfection if we trust a system, if we trust a checklist. And that system, that checklist, provides a picture that everything looks great. But deep down inside, we know that underneath, it's full of lies. But we'd rather live with the lies and an impression that everything's good than living with imperfect people. That's how I think we got this place. So how do we cure this? Is it through ethics training? Is it through moral courage? No, it's, this is a cultural thing. Okay, it requires people at the top to change policies. It requires people at the bottom to say, you know what, I wanna start telling the truth. So how much of a speaker's fee did they give me to come here and talk to you? They gave me nothing, so hopefully you got your money's worth. <laughs> Any other questions? Told you there weren't being any questions at the end. All right, thank you very much. Oh, oh, almost off. My question is, uh, so good brief. Uh, I like that you address the issues and how you want to mitigate the problem that the Army seems to be facing. But. Uh, however, okay. uh, it's one thing to say, hey guys, like just recognize that you're lying and just start telling the truth. But you did mention that you have 297 training days worth of stuff to do in 257 days. So just because you say stop lying and start telling the truth doesn't like subtract exactly from the fact Exactly what I said. That, it doesn't get rid of the fact that you have more than. Right. Right. So, so is there, so like what are the steps in order to try to reduce that problem? I mean, like it's one thing to just say stop lying, but as long as they still have to do that much training in such a little bit period of time. And it's not just the training, it's, it's everything. Okay. Right. Um, I'm policy, not execution, and so I don't have to answer that question. That's a, no, I mean, I mean, no, I mean, yes, you're asking the question, so what are you gonna do about all these requirements that are placed on us? And I, none of us control that. It's somebody up there, but unfortunately, somebody up there are people just like us. And they're looking at their little areas, so if I'm in charge of safety, I'll say, hey, some guy down the war college says the trips is a waste of time. Well, what do you wanna do, have people killed? I mean, do you want soldiers to die? Fine, we can get rid of trips. Okay, we'll leave trips alone. We go to the next thing. Every single person thinks that there's, whatever they're in charge of is contributing to the welfare of our soldiers. And so then after we go through all 183 of them, guess what, how many have we reduced? None. And we go back and say, let's try it again. What do you think about trips? And so we, we have a hard time. What we need is someone over top of that whole system to say, all right, stop bickering. You. We're gonna drop you to once every five years, okay? Okay, the Air Force cut their requirements by 40%, 40%. When the Secretary of the Army said, boom, it's going, they said 40% of the stuff, including how to operate a fire extinguisher, okay? The Marines still have to take tobacco cessation classes even if they don't smoke, true? Yep, yeah. okay, so it's not just the Army, the Navy, has a name for this, what I'm calling. Does anyone know what, in the Navy what they call this? Gun decking. In the Navy, they call it gun decking. You know, Harry did the whole study, and the Navy has a name for it, okay? So it's not just the Army, okay? You go talk to physicians, they have the same problem. Education, they have the same problem, okay? So, but my point is, is yes, yes, I totally agree. Someone needs to deal, exercise restraint. But while that happens, we have to start with a little miniature rebellion on our own saying, 
excuse me, I just want to tell the truth. I want to tell the truth, okay? Not really an answer, but it took up some time, okay? Okay, great. You guys got to end it here. Uh, let's give Dr. Wong a hand. So Dr. Wong, two points for the crew here. Number one, literally everyone here has an honor code at their institution, and it starts with us. It does start at your level. I will not lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. If we can internalize that here, we carry that forward as junior leaders, whether we're in the military or in business or in government. The second uh, thing, while you're a cadet leader here, based on what Dr. Wong just said, think about requirements as you pass them down in your opportunity when you're exercising leadership. Think about the requirements first and whether you really need to do X, Y, and Z before you pass them down your chain of command. If we did more of that as leaders, we'd eliminate some of this problem of overtasking. So great presentation, Dr. Wong. Thanks very much for your insights. We don't want you to leave totally without something. So an azimuth <laughs> to guide you home. <laughs>